Hi class! Today we're going to learn about how cells communicate and signal messages to each other. So you'll learn how all the amazing cells in your body and in other organisms coordinate their functions and behaviors. Now you might wonder, how can cells possibly talk to each other? They don't have a mouth like I do. Well, cells communicate using molecules such as the ones pictured here to relay messages to each other. Now, while cells use molecules instead of talking directly like you do, their modes of communication are in some ways similar to yours. So imagine you were in class and you wanted to uh, give a message to a friend of yours. Now, if your friend was sitting right next to you, you could do direct communication by whispering the message in your friend's ear. If on the other hand, your friend was sitting further away from you, you could do short distance communication by passing a note. If your friend was in a different room or even a different building, you could still communicate the message. You could do long distance communication, such as by sending a text message using your phone. So now we will talk about how cells engage in direct, short distance and long distance communication. So if cells are right next to each other, they can do direct cell communication in one of two ways. In one method, a cell is sending a molecule directly from its cytoplasm into the cytoplasm of the adjacent cell. And they do so through these junctions um, that in plant cells are called plasmodesmata and in animal cells, they're called gap junctions. On the other hand, Cells can also communicate using molecules that are sticking out of their plasma membrane. So there isn't a molecule being directly passed from the cytoplasm of one to the cytoplasm of the next, but rather these membrane bound molecules are binding to each other and interacting and sending a message that way. So short distance communication occurs when cells are close to each other, not directly touching, but fairly close. So let's say this cell over here, and here's its nucleus, has some nearby neighbors and it wants to send a message to them. So it just produces some molecules that diffuse out of the cell and are sent to close by cells. On the right here is a picture of a specialized form of short distance communication that occurs in your nervous system. So don't worry about all the details here, but let's just say that it shows these cells called neurons that have specialized branches. And so here's the branch of one neuron. And what I'd like you to notice is a vesicle that contains signaling molecules. So the vesicle releases these signaling molecules out of the cell and they diffuse across this little space and then bind to the next cell and then send a message that way. So now long distance communication often occurs using hormones as the signaling molecules. So in animals, your endocrine glands produce hormones. And here's a picture of the main endocrine glands in humans. So let's say that your thyroid produced the hormone. That thyroid hormone would be released into the bloodstream and it travels through your body and certain target cells then respond. And it's not just animals that make hormones, plants make hormones also. So let's take this caterpillar that's chewing on the leaf. As it's injuring the leaf cells, these leaf cells produce a hormone called jasmonic acid that they then diffuse through the air to other nearby leaves and even to leaves on adjacent plants, signaling them to make compounds to begin protecting themselves from future caterpillar attack. So I think that's pretty neat. So now we will talk about how a cell actually perceives a signal and then responds to it. So first, I'd like you to imagine a scenario. Imagine you are on a safari in Africa and suddenly you come face to face with an angry hippo. This actually happened to a friend of mine when she was only 12. So how does your body respond? Well, when you see that hippo, your brain cells signal your adrenal gland cells to produce a hormone called epinephrine, which you might have heard of before as adrenaline. So this epinephrine or adrenaline travels through your blood to 
to liver and muscle cells, and it will signal those liver and muscle cells to produce an enzyme that breaks down glycogen to many individual glucose molecules. So why do we need that to happen? Well, when you see that angry hippo, what do you need to do? You need to run. And to run, you need energy. This glucose will be used as a quick source of energy for your muscle cells. Now, when scientists were first studying this process, one interesting thing they found was that epinephrine never enters the liver and muscle cells. If it doesn't enter them, how does it signal the cells to produce the enzyme for glycogen breakdown? Well, when scientists thought about this, they realized that epinephrine must be perceived at the plasma membrane, and then one or more intermediate steps must occur inside the cell before the enzyme is made. So next, we're going to talk about more details of how signaling molecules are actually perceived, what those intermediate steps consist of, and then how they lead to a final response.